He is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, hopefully you call back. Well, happy Easter, St. Thomas's Church. Well, this morning, I believe Easter can be summed up in one word, hope, hope. Now, the biblical idea of hope that I'm discussing is not the belief that something good might happen. It is the belief, it is the knowledge that something great will happen happen. It is guaranteed because God has promised it. And and I want us, as we look at our two readings, I believe that they show us that Easter gives us three of these great, promised, guaranteed biblical hopes. The hope of everlasting life, hope that is for sinners, and uh, and the hope that those we love will come to have the same hope. The hope of everlasting life, that this hope of everlasting life is for sinners, and that the hope that we will, that those we love will come to have the same hope in Christ. So, our first hope, the hope of of eternal life. Though our biblical lens for this Easter service is John's gospel, the Bible is consistent all the way through that Jesus physically rose from the dead on Easter morning. It consistently says that Christ had been crucified to death, that his lungs were shredded by the cross, and that his abdomen was pierced by a spear, thus killing the rest of his organs. So he was certainly dead when they put him in the tomb on Good Friday. But yet, here he is, three days later, alive. And not just merely alive, not just resuscitated, but recreated, resurrected. Recreated, resurrected into a body that is impervious, that is immune to sickness, to weakness, to decay, even to death. Some of us may remember Dr. Kent Brandt. Um, he is an American doctor who contracted Ebola when he went to go serve in, the, in uh, West Africa in 2014. When he contracted it, he was taken back to America, and he was as close as a person could get to dying. But he recovered. He recovered fully. And as a result... He is now completely immune from Ebola. He can never catch it again. And in 2019, Dr. Brandt went back to West Africa when there was another Ebola outbreak. Why? Because his immunity meant that he could never catch Ebola again. And this allowed him to serve uh, those who were infected without fear. Now, without fear not only means that Dr. Brandt was no longer afraid of catching or infecting others, but this without fear extended to his family. His wife and his children were no longer afraid of him catching it. They were no, or they were freed rather, of the worry that their husband and their father would get this disease and die. He had passed through it. He had defeated it. And now Ebola could never hurt him again. Now, Dr. Brandt's story gives us a glimpse of the power of Jesus' resurrection. You see, Jesus hadn't just passed through an illness and gained immunity to it. He had passed through the ultimate illness. He had passed through death. And now Jesus is literally a walking antibody against death. And what's more is that this resurrection just wasn't for him. He worked his entire life to save us. And he won for us the same resurrection body that will be immune from death itself. 
This has been a season of worry. We worry that our, well, we worry about our own weakness. We worry about the weaknesses of those we love. And, and for the Smith family, the worry and fear that we feel for our loved ones has been the greatest weight we've carried since this all began. And so, what beautiful news is the promise of Easter to us. The promise that there will be a day when not only can I and you stop worrying about our own health, but, but we will also have that day when we will never have to worry about those we love. We will never have to worry about them getting sick them getting old, them getting, them dying. Yes, this is a future event, but, but you see, Easter morning guarantees that what happened to Christ will happen for us. So, our first great hope, our first great biblical guarantee is that um, we will have resurrection bodies which will never die. But for us, the news gets even better because our second great hope is that Jesus offers this hope. Jesus gives this hope to sinners. One of the most confounding things about our scriptural passage, our, our gospel in, a, in a John's gospel this, this morning, is the faithlessness of the disciples who come to the tomb, is the faithlessness of Mary Magdalene, of Peter, and of John. You see, Jesus had told his disciples numerous times that he would be arrested, crucified, but on the third day he would rise again. He also showed them from the Old Testament that this was true. Thus, the empty tomb should have been a source of great joy for them. But instead, as we see, it became the source of great confusion for them. Mary Magdalene, she assumed that Jesus had been stolen by his enemies. Peter left the tomb bewildered and confused and stumbled back home. John, it seems, began to believe, but he wasn't fully convinced. Now, keep in mind, these were three people that Jesus had called in the midst of their sin to come follow him. Mary Magdalene, we are told by the scriptures, was possessed by seven spirits. Peter and John were greedy businessmen who ignored Jewish law to make themselves rich. And after they were called for three years, they went and followed Jesus and watched him perform miracle after miracle. And just a few days earlier, they watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They knew better. They'd heard better. They'd experienced better. But their confusion and disbelief was therefore foolishness. I've got many foolish examples in my life, of my own life, but uh, one that comes to mind is was uh, when I was practicing law, I was blessed with an amazing paralegal. She was bright, she was hardworking, and above all, she was organized and diligent. She was very thorough in, in her work. And she had this way of keeping track not only of her responsibilities, but doing an excellent, thorough job with each one. And she had never missed an assignment. Now, I'd worked with her for about a year, in, in my youth, in my foolishness, I got worried about an assignment. Um, I was worried that it wouldn't be finished on time or wouldn't be finished in, in an acceptable form. And so I went into her office and asked her about it, asked if I could even take a look at it. And she just looked at me. And I could hear her eyes say, Oh fool, you of little faith. Have I not given you enough evidence for you to know that I will not fail you? Well, she dealt with me graciously. But of course, that brings up the question of, well, in the midst of these doubters, how does Jesus deal with them? Well, as, as, as uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle says, 
when uh, commenting on this passage, he says that he deals with them not out of vengeance or wrath, but out of kindness and graciousness. Ra writes, Jesus speaks at this moment as if all was forgiven and forgotten. His first thought is to bind up their wounds, reanimate their courage, and restore them to their former place. Moreover, if that wasn't gracious enough, to the one who doubted this morning the most, he shows the most immediate kindness, and love. Mary, he says. He reveals himself to her by calling her name. And ironically, only in the kingdom of God, ironically, her greater doubt was the reason why Jesus showed her the greater love. Now, throughout the course of this, as I talk to people and text with them, um, and, and actually as I look inside of my own heart, I hear a startling confession. I'm doubting. When I look around at the suffering and the danger and the inability of, of our political leaders, both Republican and Democrat, when I look at the inability of technology and experts to save us, it feels like God's not in control. I doubt him. I doubt his goodness. Some even say I, I'm even doubting his existence. Now, if any of those fears have grasped your heart like they grasped mine, Jesus has good news for us. If the disciples' weaknesses and doubts did not disqualify them from his love, then our doubts, our weaknesses, will not disqualify us. In fact, in the great irony of how God works, in the midst of our greatest doubts, Jesus comes to us and reveals himself more fully. Because you see, all that's needed, all that's needed for doubters to be to, to take hold of this great hope of the resurrection is to confess their doubts and say, Lord, I believe, help me in my disbelief. Lord, I have worries, I have fears, I have questions. But yet, Lord, I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to rest in what you promise. And though my faith may not be perfect, though my faith may only be the size of a mustard seed, you and your generosity have promised that that is enough for us. So, the guaranteed hope of the resurrection, the guaranteed hope that, that this is offered even to us sinful doubters. And then third, the hope that those we love will also have a resurrection hope. The hope that those we love will also have a resurrection hope. Again, going back to our uh, John passage, immediately after Jesus reveals himself to Mary, Mary wants to hold on to him. She wants to stay in this beautiful moment with her beloved Savior, just the two of them. But you see, Jesus commands something more. He tells her to go and tell the other doubters, the same one that only doubted Jesus but doubted her. She tells, or he tells her to go and tell them the good news. He is alive. Again, as I spoke with um, others over these past few weeks, and as I looked at my own uh, circle or sphere of uh, relationships, um, what I've found is that so many of us are worried for the peace and salvation, those we love, but that do not know Christ. They do not know the love and forgiveness of our Savior Jesus. And when we talk with them, uh, we can hear the anxiety in their voices. In fact, it's overwhelming them. Why? Because the way that they viewed the world, uh, be it in another God or 
or in the God of science and technology or even in the God of themselves, I can get myself through this. Those worldviews are being shaken at their very foundation. All that they thought and all that they were competent in has been stripped away and they're terrified. And we love them so much, we just want them to know the peace that surrendering to a loving, powerful God would give them. But there's a deeper fear, too. There's a deeper want. Even worse, we fear, what if they were to get sick and die? What would happen to them? We want them to be part of this resurrection with us in the future. We want them to be comforted by the promise that they will be with Jesus and us for eternity. And as we see in Acts 10... We see that real conversion of people is possible. Here in Acts 10, we see that Peter went out and told this good news of Jesus Christ resurrected for, for sinners to people he loved. People that were different from him in every possible way, but yet he loved them. And what was the result? Some of them believed. Despite every obstacle in Peter's life, Peter's inability to speak clearly, Peter's lack of education. All Peter had was his experience with the love and forgiveness and the resurrected Jesus. That's all he had to offer. And in spite of the doubts and the confusion and the concerns and the questions of the people that he was speaking to, despite all of these obstacles and doubt, the Holy Spirit moved through Peter's simple words and saved people brought them to, to faith, convicted them of sin, but more importantly, convicted them of God's love for them, and that there's a possibility, there's a reality that our Savior Christ rose from the dead and in doing so promised eternal life. So, one of the guarantees this Easter story gives us is that when we go out and tell, some will believe it's promised. When we let go of the legs of Jesus and when we tell those we love, not because we have to, but because we love them too much not to, we will see that God will live into his promise and that we will watch God work. Next week, St. Thomas will be releasing some talks and some testimonies that share the power of the resurrection in some people's lives. I want you to listen to them. Uh, be encouraged by them. Share them with three non-Christian friends in your life. And share your own story of the power of Jesus' resurrection, the hope that he brings in your own life. Will all believe? No. Will some laugh? Yes. Will some doubt? Yes. But will some believe? Our scriptures say yes. That is a promise that we call hope. So, on this Easter morning, let me end with this. If Easter means anything, it means hope. Hope, knowing that God promises and guarantees new, indestructible, immune bodies that will never get sick, that will never grow old, that will never die. And he promises this, not to the good and the great, he promises this to sinners, to doubters, to the weak to those who with small faith cry out, Lord Jesus, I don't have the faith, but save me anyway. And then thirdly, he gives us the promise, the hope, the guarantee that when we share the good news of the hope of Jesus Christ with others, some will believe. And that is good news for us sinners indeed on this Easter Sunday morning. Amen.